Good Monday morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, violence rages. Shootings erupt across the country this weekend. Multiple people are dead and dozens are injured after shootings break out from Austin to Chicago and from Cleveland to Savannah. We'll take a closer look at the dangerous crime wave. Facing Moscow, President Biden in Brussels right now starting NATO meetings. But in two days, he'll go face to face in Geneva with Vladimir Putin. NBC News has the worldwide exclusive interview with the Russian leader before this highly anticipated meeting. President Biden, of course, is radically different from Trump. And it is my great hope that, yes, there are some advantages, some disadvantages. What the Russian leader is saying about President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump. Cruel treatment, new details about the conditions that the January 6th Capitol Hill riot suspects are being held in, from solitary confinement to dangerous health incidents. We'll take a closer look inside their DC jail cells. And heavy traffic, Americans are back on the road again, but don't expect to be moving any faster. Congestion is building across the country, but it's not because people are returning to the office. Why the pandemic is now slowing down our streets. As we have both noticed, when we've been in airports, it's also slowing you down if you're heading in the air. <laughs> people are back. <laughs> yes, it's just tough to get around right now. <laughs> but I guess it's nice that people are able to travel and take exactly. a vacation. Exactly. We'll get to that in a bit. But we begin, though, with the string of gun violence across the country this weekend. Between Friday and Sunday, at least 10 cities reported mass shootings. Those are shootings with four or more victims. Several of those cities saw gunfire more than once. NBC News correspondent Kathy Park joins us now. And Kathy, I want to start by asking you about two of the shootings that really made a lot of headlines over the weekend. The first in Austin on Saturday turned fatal. What more can you tell us about that one? Hey, Joe, good morning to you. Yeah, it certainly was a violent weekend in Austin. In total, 14 people were shot. And we just learned over the weekend that a 25-year-old uh, died from his injuries. And according to police in Austin, the shooting happened early Saturday morning in a very uh, busy entertainment district in downtown Austin. Lots of bars and restaurants. In fact, since things are back open, uh, they were seeing pre-pandemic crowds. So lots of people were in the area at the time when shots rang out and uh, but fortunately officers were already in the area so they were able to react quickly and help uh, the wounded in fact some of them were actually able to pull uh, some of the victims into their own police cars and then transport them to the hospital uh, right now we know that one suspect is in custody a juvenile meanwhile another suspect is at large and as far as what may have sparked this violence uh, officials are saying that this was a dispute between two parties. Joe? And Kathy, right before the Austin shooting, there was one in Savannah, Georgia, Friday night. Some of the victims were children. What are we learning about that incident? Yeah, another uh, very sad and tragic uh, event in Savannah, Georgia. This one happened on Friday night, and those victims range in age from 13 months to 33 years old. And this situation was a little bit different because it happened in a residential area. And we we're told uh, from law enforcement there that uh, there was a car that drove by uh, some of these apartment complexes. And there were several people outside of one of the homes, and then someone in that vehicle began uh, firing at this crowd and uh, they uncovered 60 shell casings just to show you how many shots rang out uh, into the crowd and um, we know that seven people were shot one person was killed and the police chief said that they are investigating this incident and possibly seeing any sort of connection with another shooting that happened just a couple days prior take a listen we were out there on Tuesday night. No one would talk to us. We went back out on Wednesday, uh, sent detectives out in plain clothes. Still, nobody would provide any information to us. Two days later, we end up with a mass shooting at the same location. And the chief noted that this was no coincidence, and he's asking witnesses to step forward with any sort of information. And right now, they still don't have any suspects. Kathy, no. nationwide, when it comes to gun violence, 2021 is off to a horrible start in the first half of the year. Can you put it all into context for us? 
Yeah, Joe, I mean, gun violence has been creeping up pretty much all across the country. And we, we've been taking a closer look at numbers provided by uh, the gun violence archive and approximately 270 mass shootings. That's how much they have recorded so far this year. And when you compare stats from this time uh, last year to, to now, uh, mass shootings are up 40 percent and then 65 percent higher than 2019. And also worth noting, um, so far this year, 8,700 people have died due to gun violence. So, so, Kathy, what are we seeing law enforcement do to try and curb the violence? It really depends on the community and, and who you ask. Um, for example, in, in Austin, Texas, obviously, uh, this latest uh, this latest uh, shooting, this mass shooting, uh, prompted the conversation once again about what to do next. In fact, uh, gun violence has gone up over the past several years. So a uh, violence prevention uh, office has been created as of last summer. So they plan on uh, beefing up support there. And then in Savannah, Georgia, they plan on taking more of a, a community-based support. And they plan on having a community forum to discuss what happened over the weekend, Joe. All right, Kathy Park. Thank you so much, Kathy. This morning, we're hearing promising news in the fight against the coronavirus. The CDC says over 309 million doses of the vaccine have been administered and almost 144 million Americans are now fully vaccinated. NBC News Now correspondent Priscilla Thompson joins us to walk through the biggest COVID headlines of the morning. Priscilla, good to see you. So now to think that we are counting the number of doses in the hundreds of millions. I mean, it sounds like really good news. This was unthinkable a year ago when, of course, we didn't even have a vaccine developed. Tell us about these numbers and how officials are feeling about them. Well, Savannah, we have come quite a way here. Uh, 309 million doses administered. Uh, we know that 374 million doses have been delivered to those folks who are getting shots into arms. And to break those numbers down a step further, we've got 144 million Americans fully vaccinated and 174 million who have gotten at least that first dose. And this, of course, coming as Joe Biden has set that goal of getting 70 percent of the country vaccinated by the 4th of July. Uh, right now, the CDC has that number at around 64 percent of adults who have received at least that first dose. So very exciting and promising news all around. Savannah. And now, Priscilla, a judge has actually tossed out a lawsuit from 117 Houston Methodist Hospital employees over vaccine work requirements. They were trying to require them there for employees. Why did the judge rule this way? Yeah, the judge said that that lawsuit brought by those plaintiffs uh, had been misconstrued, had misconstrued the law and uh, misrepresented the facts. Uh, she said that this uh, requirement was not a violation of due process because these were at will employees and that it wasn't coercion because a business has the right to choose how they want to run uh, their business. She also debunked some of the concerns in that lawsuit that the vaccine was unapproved and forced medical experimentation, pointing to that FDA approval. Uh, now, the lawyer for those plaintiffs has said that this fight is not over and they are going to continue to move forward with this process. Savannah. All right. And Priscilla, quickly before I let you go, the FDA has told Johnson & Johnson to toss tens of millions of vaccine doses. What happened? Uh, yeah, that has to do with some doses that were manufactured at a plant in Baltimore. It was found that the ingredients used to make the Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, in those doses had been contaminated with some materials used to make the AstraZeneca vaccine, which was also being manufactured at that plant. And a subsequent uh, inspection by the FDA also found that there were unsanitary conditions at that plant and that the workers had not been trained properly. Savannah? All right, Priscilla Thompson, thank you so much. This morning, drug maker Novavax is releasing data from its phase three clinical trials. The company says the results show its coronavirus vaccine is highly effective. 90% effective overall, Novavax says, 93% effective against coronavirus variants. 
and 100% effective at preventing moderate to severe illness. Novavax now plans to apply for emergency use authorization with the FDA in the third quarter. Let's bring in NBC News medical contributor Dr. Natalie Azar. So I guess the first question is, how much does the U.S. really need this? The country already has enough doses of Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson, enough to vaccinate enough Americans and hopefully hit herd immunity. So what role would Novavax play? Well, good morning, Joe. You know, I, I'm I'm always one to say that I don't think you can ever have too enough, too too much, excuse me, or enough of a vaccine in this in this scenario. You know, and and I think it's important to remind individuals that you know even for the flu vaccine, we have multiple drug makers who make the flu vaccine every year. But you know, clearly, I, I don't think it's going to be um, an essential part of the U.S. arsenal. Um, but we know that this is a a global effort, and it certainly needs to be um, an, an international effort. Uh, and that's where it's really going to play an important role. They are already planning on, uh, you know, uh, giving many of their doses to COVAX, which, of course, is the international coalition, uh, you know, partly uh, funded also by the WHO. They plan on producing close to 100 million doses per month, up to 150 million doses per month in the near future. It is a two dose regimen. So I think it'll play an essential part uh, in the global effort against this virus and pandemic. Joe, let's talk about the results. What do you make of them? How do they compare to the other three, Moderna, Pfizer, and J&J? They really are remarkable. They're really on par with what we saw with the mRNA vaccines with 90% efficacy overall and 100% efficacy um, in preventing severe disease, which of course is the important outcome. And then they're also found to be re reasonably very good efficacy against uh, the UK variant as well as the South African variant. We don't have data yet on the Delta variant. That's the variant that was first seen in India. I think it's important too to emphasize to folks um, that they actually, this vaccine utilizes the technology that has been used before in vaccines that have come to market, for example, hepatitis B and the shingles vaccine. So for any people who are still reluctant or suspicious because some of the newer technology used, for example, for the mRNA vaccines may see the Novavax vaccine as something that they'd be more likely to take. And there is a possibility that we might get some, uh, you know, more refractory, hesitant folks out there vaccinated with this one. All right. Dr. Natalie Azar, thank you so much, Dr. Azar. We appreciate it. Today, President Biden is meeting with NATO allies in Brussels ahead of his highly anticipated summit with Russian President Vladimir Putin. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander joins us now from Brussels. Peter, good morning. So what's on the agenda for the NATO summit? Hey, Savannah, this is a critical day for the United States and for this president, his first NATO summit. It really does mark an American reset of sorts. We've already heard from President Biden here in his first remarks, sitting alongside the head of NATO, effectively taking a very different view than the former president, President Trump, who at one point called this transatlantic alliance obsolete and threatened to quit the group. President Biden today saying that the alliance instead is vital and that the U.S.'s obligation to it is a sacred one. So very different perspectives here. And it's being welcomed by these allies of the United States. There are going to be a series of key topics that they focus on. Obviously, at the top of the list will be a rising China and a more aggressive Russia. Cyber threats certain to be high on the list of the conversations they'll have behind closed doors here as well. Uh, today, you're going to hear from the president as he speaks to the president of Turkey, President Erdogan there. There is a serious relationship and a series of challenges between those two countries as well, including what happens along the Turkish-Syrian border there. After Afghanistan, another topic that will likely be a focus today with the U.S. committed to withdrawing its troops in that country by September. The president will need to address some of these allies' concerns that it is uh, too quick and too soon and that it could destabilize that region. Savannah. All right. And now, Peter, also, what is President Biden saying about his meeting with President Putin? Yes, yeah, so that meeting now only a matter of hours, days away, right? It's going to take place on Wednesday in Geneva, Switzerland. The president departs here tomorrow for that summit. And I'm told by the National Security Advisor that the president will be consulting with allies behind closed doors on that conversation to try to make sure he has their full su uh, support, that they are in solidarity in terms of the message that he's delivering. Obviously, the topic of these cyber attacks, the ransomware attacks and others that the FBI says have come from Russia will be uh, at the top of the list. 
We had a chance to speak to the president yesterday I was, as I was traveling with him aboard Air Force One and he held a news conference and I asked him why he thought after the U.S. has slapped sanctions on Russia over so many years in the past and it hasn't changed Russia's behavior, what he could do differently to do that. And he said there is no guarantee that any U.S. president can change Russia's behavior, but that he does want to try to find places where there may be room for agreement on arms control and the like, and also to deliver a tough message on those other topics as well. And following Vladimir Putin's suggestion that he might be opening to a prisoner swap of sorts as it relates to cyber criminals. The president um, offered an openness to that, but later the White House clarified and said it's not that the U.S. has any hackers that they are holding right now who have hacked into Russia, but if they were to find any cyber criminals, that all countries must hold them accountable. Savannah. All right, Peter, thank you so much. NBC News spoke exclusively with Russian President Vladimir Putin ahead of this week's meeting with President Biden. In a wide-ranging interview, President Putin pushed back against claims that Russia was behind recent cyber attacks and said he was open to a prisoner swap with the U.S. NBC News senior international correspondent Keir Simmons sat down with Putin. As he prepares to face off with Vladimir Putin this week, President Biden saying he agrees with what Russia's leader told us about relations with the U.S. I think he's right. It's a low point. Top of the agenda for their high-stakes summit, cyber warfare. Recent attacks on U.S. infrastructure, some linked to Russian-based criminals, have raised concerns over a new Cold War. Putin tells NBC News Russia is not to blame. Mr. Pre President, are you waging a cyber war against America? No, 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 Where is the evidence? Where is proof? It's becoming farcical. We know it well. We have been accused of all kinds of things, election interference, cyber attacks, and so on and so forth. And not once, not once, not one time did they bother to produce any kind of evidence or proof, just unfounded accusations. The U.S. intelligence community has produced evidence of Russian hackers targeting the federal government and meddling in U.S. elections. And this year, the U.S. has seen multiple criminal ransomware attacks extorting millions of dollars. Russian-speaking criminals, is the allegation, are targeting the American way of life, food, gas, water, hospitals, uh, transport. Uh, why would you let Russian-speaking criminals disrupt your diplomacy. You know, the simplest thing to do would be for us to sit down calmly and agree on joint work in cyberspace. We are willing to engage with international participants, including the United States. You are the ones who have refused to engage in joint work. The Biden administration has been insisting Russia should not harbor cyber criminals. The Trump administration called Russia's offers to talk disingenuous. The Kremlin has been accused of violating existing international cyber agreements. Now the Russian leader admitting to NBC News he is concerned that the U.S. can target Russia. What people can be afraid of in America, the very same thing can be a danger to us. U.S. is a high-tech country. NATO has declared cyberspace an area of combat. That means they are planning something. They are preparing something. So obviously this cannot but worry us. Do you fear that uh, American intelligence is deep inside Russian systems and has the ability uh, to do you a lot of damage? I'm not afraid, but I bear in mind that it is a possibility. When President Biden sits down with President Putin, he's expected to raise the cases of two Americans who the State Department say are unfairly convicted in Russia. Paul Whelan and Trevor Reed, uh, they are two former uh, Marines. Trevor Reed is suffering from COVID in prison. Uh, why don't you release them ahead of the summit? Wouldn't that show goodwill? I know that we have certain US citizens who are in prison, have been convicted. But if one considers the number of Russian Federation citizens who are in U.S. prisons, then these numbers don't even compare. And on the prisoner swap question, is that something that you would consider? Yes, 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 of course.
Russia has proposed a prisoner swap before. Secretary of State Blinken saying the Americans are being held as political pawns. President Putin insists he can work with Biden on complicated issues and build a stable and predictable relationship. Let us sit down together, talk, look for compromise solutions that are acceptable for all the parties. That is how stability is achieved. Well, President Biden says, uh, one time when you met, you were inches away from each other. And he said to you, I'm looking in your eyes and I can't see a soul. And you said, we understand each other. Do you remember that exchange? But I do not remember this particular part of our conversations, to be honest with you. He probably has a good memory. But the Kremlin has been cracking down on political opponents like Alexei Navalny, a Putin critic who was poisoned and is now in prison. President Biden has vowed to raise Navalny's case when they meet. A Russian court has just, well, uh, well a, a Ru excuse me, I'm sorry, a Russian court has just outlawed organizations connected to Mr. Navalny. Uh, literally every non-systematic opposition figure is facing criminal charges. Mr. President, it's as if dissent is simply not tolerated in Russia anymore. We, well, you are presenting it as dissent and intolerance towards dissent in Russia. We view it completely differently. Will you commit that you will personally ensure that Alexei Navalny will leave prison alive? I proceed from the premise that the person that you have mentioned, the same kind of measures will apply, not in any way worse than to anybody else who happens to be in prison. His name is Alexei Navalny. People will note that you were I don't care. to say I don't that care. he would leave prison alive. For now, both sides are downplaying how much progress can be achieved at this week's summit. It's Keir Simmons with that interview, and we'll bring you more from President Putin in our next hour. Let's get a check now on your morning news now weather. And Bill Cairns is with us, of course, and we know millions are at risk of experiencing severe thunderstorms. Tell us about that, Bill. Yeah, good morning. I hope you guys had a wonderful weekend. Uh, yeah, we're not going to see everyone of those 25 million getting hit by severe storms today, but the storms that do form will be on the strong side. So those people in that area need to keep an eye on it. We actually already this morning have a line of pretty strong storms that's rolling through highly populated areas of Connecticut and Massachusetts right now, about to move into Hartford. These are not severe storms, but they're going to be some strong gusty winds and there's some lightning, which is kind of unusual for this early in the morning. And then there's another line of showers back towards Detroit. And when that one swings through the mid-Atlantic later on this afternoon. I think that's where we're going to get to some isolated severe storms. So from New York City southward, almost all of New Jersey, a good chunk of southeast uh, Pennsylvania, including Harrisburg to Philadelphia, Baltimore, D.C., a good chunk of Maryland and Delaware is in this risk in the area of yellow. I don't think we're going to get tornadoes today, but wind damage is the biggest threat, and maybe a couple storms could produce some hail. The other huge story, and this one will be with us all week long, and I'm afraid maybe even all summer, is the heat in the West. We have 38 million people under heat advisories, heat watches, heat warnings, and a lot of it, the worst of it, is in the desert Southwest. I mean, they're used to the heat, but it's shaping up to be a really hot, long summer. So today, temperatures about 10 to 20 degrees warmer than it should be. I mean, that Billings stands out. 100 degrees today in Billings. Look at Salt Lake City at 103. Tomorrow, it's not like the heat's going anywhere. 106 in Montana. Phoenix is up to 118. And then towards the middle end of the week, Southern California starts to get into the mix, too, with the heat spreading. Look at Sacramento on Thursday, 108. Friday, 106. And no relief in sight for Phoenix either. Easily 114 to 118 all week long. And some of the heat bleeds into the middle of the country. So when you guys see a map like this that is all red and all orange, it's almost officially summer, guys. Uh, yeah, wow. and, uh, as we said, we've been talking about the drought for so long now. Uh, I don't see how it's going to cool off in the West either. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Long fire season ahead. All right. Thanks, Bill. Yeah. Coming up, preteens could be next to get the coronavirus vaccine. We'll take you inside the trials going on at the moment and hear from the family of a five-year-old who's participating next.
Pfizer says they expect to be administering their vaccine to young children as early as this fall. The pharmaceutical company is moving ahead with low dose trials for children under 12 years old after wrapping early testing of the vaccine. Johnson and Johnson and Moderna are also testing their vaccines on children. Now, according to the CDC, over 142,000 children under the age of 12 have received at least one COVID vaccine dose. NBC News Now correspondent Maura Barrett joins us now from the Oshner Medical Center in Jefferson, Louisiana, one of 98 facilities where Pfizer is running vaccine trials for children under the age of 12. Maura, good morning. Now, of course, a big question here is who are these kids that are participating? And I know you spoke with one family about how they came to the decision to vaccinate their five-year-old son, have him in this trial. What can you tell us about that conversation and also how it highlights the debates about inoculating children just in general? Well, Savannah, there's a lot of speculation and anxiety from parents about having their young children get the vaccines. Obviously, we've seen that young kids react differently to the virus itself. And so there's confusion about how they'll react to the vaccines. Now, I spoke with the Halperin Chaudhry family. Their five-year-old son, Khalil, is one of the kids here participating in the trial. And they said that there was some safety concerns initially in terms of what would be reported if there was any issues with the vaccines. But once they found out that he was going to be able to be a part of this trial, they said they were all in because they know that getting the children across the country inoculated is really the way that we're going to handle this virus now that a lot of adults have been vaccinated. I want you to hear from some of their thought process as they chose to, to pull Khalil into the trial. I really see this on par with what we've done to care for our kids. This is, is part of the health care that we've provided. We followed the immunization schedule, and I really feel like the COVID vaccine is just on par with that. Yeah, and we see already how safe and effective the vaccine is for adults. I really trust that it's going to be as beneficial for kids. Uh, and again, it's the importance to me is that we are one community. Like the COVID affects all of us and has affected all of us this entire year. You might have seen Khalil <laughs> there playing with his family, also 12-year-old Chaya, she, or almost 12-year-old Chaya. She's counting down the days until her 12th birthday so she can get the vaccine as well. Both kids really excited. Uh, Khalil was a little camera shy, but he told me he's excited that he's going to help other people not get sick by getting the vaccine. Oh. The parents saying uh, that this is a learning lesson for their kids to help their community. Oh, that's sweet. He was camera shy because he was busy with his cat. It's understandable, you know. All right, Maura, how do doctors feel about where they are at in these trials so far? What do they think about what they're learning? So far, so good. And so the issue here is the la in last week's FDA vaccine advisory committee uh, meeting, some doctors were expressing concern that because children usually aren't symptomatic during the virus, that they might not know the exact efficacy during this trial. And so that's why they're taking a closer look with the, the section of five to 12 year olds. And then Oshner will start recruiting for the younger children as well for further trials. Uh, right now in this specific trial, 75% of the kids will be getting the actual vaccine versus the placebo. And then after six months, uh, once they find out whether or not they got the vaccine, they'll have the opportunity uh, to get that. But doctors emphasizing that taking the time and really focusing in on these different age groups will help just uh, determine how safe it'll be. And a reminder, obviously, those those vaccine trials coming back for kids a little older than 12 year old were 100 uh, percent efficacy. Savannah and more. Now, one of the big concerns here is the fact that there has been this rising number of cases of this heart inflammation condition that seems to be linked to the covid vaccine in young younger people. I know you've been talking to doctors about that. What more can you tell us? Right. And this was something, the heart inflammation issue, something that the father I spoke to, Josh, also said he was partially concerned about. But looking at the bigger picture, even though we're seeing higher than no normal numbers of these heart inflammation cases, whether or not it's it's totally uh, tied back to getting the vaccine and COVID in general is still unknown. But overall, doctors and parents alike are saying are weighing the benefits uh, and the options and saying, you know, the, the symptoms of myocarditis are not great. But the symptoms of COVID could be much worse. And myocarditis, this heart inflammation, is a lot more rare. And so they're, they're weighing the balance there and deciding, at least in Josh's and in his family's case, that getting the vaccine is worth it. All right. More, Barrett. Thank you so much. Coming up, some suspects arrested in connection with the January 6th riot on Capitol Hill are reporting dire conditions in jail. We'll take a closer look at how they're being treated while waiting trial next.
Wasabi, a three-year-old Pekingese, won best in show at the 145th Westminster Dog Show this weekend. It is the fifth time a Pekingese has been named top dog. There were big changes to the show's usual pup and circumstance this year. A new <laughs> venue in Terrytown, New York, and no in-person spectators. But Wasabi's breeder and handler say the celebrations will be just the same champagne for him and filet mignon <laughs> for the dog. Fun fact, Wasabi's grandfather won the title back in 2012, so I guess you could say that's how Wasabi's family rolls. <laughs> I like that you talk about the dog like a grandpa. <laughs> it's really funny. They're, they're all aging well. So. We actually watched some of this yesterday with my dog. That was why we put it on. And, you know, it's funny to watch a dog watch dogs. You know, cute. <laughs> Maybe next year. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. She definitely can't do it. This morning, new scrutiny surrounding an old D.C. jail where 39 defendants from the January 6th riot are awaiting trial. Some of them have requested to be released, saying they're being mistreated. Scott McFarlane, an investigative reporter from our Washington, D.C. station, WRC, joins us now with the details. Hi, Scott. Good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning to you. By our latest reporting, one out of every 10 U.S. Capitol insurrection defendants are being held in jail pre-trial. These are the most serious charges, assault or conspiracy. Nearly all of them are challenging it, trying to get released. They're fighting it, but nearly all of them are losing that fight. In the early moments of the horror of January 6th, prosecutors say Ryan Samsel of Pennsylvania was one of the first to breach a barricade and knock over a police officer, knocking her unconscious. Samsel pleaded not guilty, but then in March, he said he was the victim of a brutal assault while being held in the 45-year-old D.C. jail in Southeast, and he sought to be released. There's a dispute over who might have been responsible, but no matter, the feds are asking a judge to say no, calling Samsel a danger and citing his history of convictions for attacking women. But his requests nevertheless required hearings, filings, arguments, and former federal prosecutor Glenn Kirshner says it will also require time. In the D.C. jail is not a great place to be sitting pending trial. However, all of these complaints will be made both to the Department of Corrections and to the judges in the defendants' cases, and they will be addressed in due course. The News 4 I team has learned there are now 39 defendants from January 6th in the D.C. jail, including others filing motions complaining of conditions inside. Doug Jensen, the man accused of leading that mob toward U.S. Capitol Police Officer Eugene Goodman, is seeking release, saying he's suffering and languishing due to lockdowns at the jail, which ordered 23-hour-a-day and 22-hour-a-day lockdowns earlier this year due to COVID. Jensen has pleaded not guilty, but there are several other requests that have triggered hearings, with more to come. Issues raised by some of these riot defendants are not new, says community activist Ron Moten. This is the norm that we've been going through forever. So, I mean, welcome to the club. Moten, who served time inside in the 1990s, says the facility suffered poor ventilation and poor cooling and complaints about medical care long before the insurrection. What needs to be improved here? What needs to be changed? So what can be improved is one thing I was saying before they came there. We just need a new jail. Uh, our city's in the process of building a new jail, but it needs to be expedited because this is what we go through on a regular basis. The D.C. Department of Corrections not only declined requests for comment, but has referred any questions about January 6th defendants to the U.S. Justice Department, which is also declined to talk. Now, Scott, do we know Let me how tell you many? About one more case. Sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I, I apologize. Let me tell you about one more case. Yeah, Chris please. Morrell accused of using chemical spray against police that day. He sought to be released, saying he has not. They rejected. The request to Judge Savannah said uh, Worrell looked able bodied on the 6th at the Capitol. Mm. And how many defendants, Scott, have filed motions for release and what's the likelihood that they'll be let out or transferred? Nearly all of them are mm, seeking wow. release, and it's really clocking up the courthouse with paperwork. They're almost all being rejected, Savannah. Oh, all right, Scott, great report. Thank you so much. So far this year, 78,000 migrant children have crossed the southern border alone. That's more than all of 2019, and it's only June, and that's not counting those who came with their families. NBC News correspondent Julia Ainsley traveled to the Rio Grande Valley to meet some of those asylum seekers and the border agents trying to deal with the surge. So far this year, more children cross the southern border than in all of 2019. 
a stunning 78,000. And that's not counting children who cross the border with their families. Like Kelly, whose mother Elsa brought her from Ecuador so the six-year-old could have ear surgery. I know that it's a blessing to be able to cross over because not everyone has the same luck. Here in the Rio Grande Valley, many families like theirs with children under seven are being allowed to stay in the U.S. to await asylum hearings, even though official policy says only unaccompanied children are allowed to stay. But whether sending children alone or coming as a family, parents have a chilling decision to expose their young child to violence, hunger, and the elements for a chance at life in the United States. Brandon Kopp sees that firsthand, rescuing migrants who fall to the sweltering heat. Do you see kids out here? Almost every group is from infants uh, all the way to 17, 18 years old. And still, for many families attempting to cross the border, it can be a game of chance. These, these mothers who are coming with infants, what happens to them? Is there any guarantee? There is no guarantee that a certain individual coming in with a kid of a certain age is going to be able to remain in the United States. Despite the risk, more than 172,000 migrants attempted to cross the border illegally last month. The Border Patrol chief here said he sees some expelled families send their children back across the border alone, a prospect he worries about. We've even seen smugglers stoop to the level of kicking kids kids and people who can't swim out of a raft that's crossing the Rio Grande River, knowing that our agents will go rescue those kids and the smuggler can swim safely back to Mexico. For a migrant, though, there's really no legal path into the United States right now. They can't present themselves legally at a port of entry and expect to be able to come in and make an asylum case. Try to claim asylum in their home country. Even though we don't have asylum programs set up in their home countries now. After seeing what I've seen, I can't under any circumstances encourage them to cross the border illegally. But for many, the risk is worth the reward. Like this family, reunited after two years apart. Velkis and her daughter left Honduras for the U.S. two years ago, but she didn't have enough money to pay for her sons to cross the border as well. Until now. I couldn't sleep or eat. Who knows what they're going to find on the way? So much violence, kidnapping. Did you miss your mom? Mucho? Si, mucho. For now, many families are still choosing to take their chances for a moment like this. Coming up, going back to work with a new style. Yeah, workers are trading in their old, uncomfortable work clothes for new wardrobes after more than a year in PJs and sweats. We'll show you the new office dress code next. Freeways were pretty much free of traffic last year, with the pandemic forcing many Americans to stay at home. But now as we hit the roads again, you might find yourself spending more time stuck behind the wheel. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson shows us how a surge in online shopping is actually fueling the problem. After a year of largely untraveled freeways, Americans are hitting the road and finding a new source of congestion, delivery trucks. Experts say it's due to a surge in online ordering during the pandemic. And companies like Amazon adding more trucks for even faster delivery. A recent survey found that nationwide, over the course of 2020, total deliveries rose by almost 28 percent. Groceries in particular jumped by a staggering 103 percent. If you've driven in a city recently, you've seen it. This FedEx truck double parked. FedEx truck double parked, blocking traffic. This is the third truck that we've seen as we speak, a UPS truck double parked, blocking traffic. I can barely get around, and this is what drivers are dealing with. And with more trucks out on the road, those in charge of local infrastructure have their work cut out for them. We monitor traffic on a 24-hour basis. Here in Los Angeles, a city synonymous with driving, we were shown the Regional Traffic Management Center for Caltrans. Los Angeles and Long Beach ports carry 40% of the nation's imports. We have a lot of trucks, and as trucks are more on the pavement, we do see wear and tear on the pavement. And that has a price tag. By one estimate, bumpy roads cost California drivers $61 billion annually. 
our lifestyle of online ordering has made truck congestion a real problem. And it's made worse every time you click that same day or next day button, putting more pressure on companies to deliver packages faster, which obviously makes the roads more congested, and it really pounds infrastructure and highways just like this one. And it's only going to get worse. According to projections from the World Economic Forum, delivery vehicles in the top 100 cities globally will rise 36 percent by 2030, increasing congestion by over 21 percent and adding an average of 11 minutes to your daily commute. For its part, FedEx told us in a statement their trucks are a critical link in accommodating rapid growth in e-commerce and meeting fast changing consumer demands. Amazon and UPS weren't available for comment. Do you think this is something that is going to be a measurable problem for Caltrans? It's just a new way of doing commerce. Ensuring our nation's roadways remain clear and resilient as we get back to normal. Steve Patterson, NBC News, Los Angeles. After a year of working from home, many of us got used to doing our jobs in our pajamas. Well, now millions are preparing to return to the office, and for most, that means putting on a more constricting pair of pants. Clothing stores are seeing a boom in sales with comfier options being popular choices, and designers are now taking notice. As one analyst reminds us pretty harshly, you can't go back to the office in your slippers. NBC News business reporter Leticia Miranda joins us now. Uh, I think she's joining us from home, so I'm not exactly sure what type of pants she might be wearing since we're all getting pretty comfortable. But Leticia, tell us about what a post-pandemic wardrobe could look like. I mean, are we going to be going back to jeggings, the comfortable version of jeans? Oh, and actually, it seems like we have lost Leticia, so hopefully we will be able to get her back here shortly. Oh, and we've got her, Leticia. Hello. <laughs> From Hi, home seat. So look it, look it. There's there's the comfier pants. There's the we lose the Skype. All that kind of stuff happens when we're working from home. I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us, I mean, what are these trends? We all want to kind of keep a little bit of what we've done over the last year. I think some of us liked it. Yeah, so uh, retailers definitely are paying attention. Um, nobody's really ready to go back to totally, you know, office casual. Um, so some of the things that retailers are seeing and doing is that they're seeing that people want more comfortable styles. They want looser pants, um, you know, being allowed to go back into the office with speakers. People are trading in their flats and heels for, you know, uh, nicer white sneakers. Um, and so one of the things that uh, M.M. LaFleur, which is uh, uh, they work exclusively on women's workwear, um, one of the things that they're seeing is uh, rising sales for what they call power casual, which includes <laughs> an item called a jardigan. It's just an example of one of the products that's really taking off right now. Um, and so this is a blazer that's essentially made out of cardigan material. <laughs> and it kind of is a little more stretchy, kind of breathes a little bit more. Um, and so it's just one of the, you know, products that are kind of, you know, uh, iconic for for t this time when yeah. people aren't quite ready to put on zip up trousers again. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know. I think we're not looking forward to the zippers and the buttons. I used to joke around when I was working from home that I was only getting my top half ready because it really didn't matter. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, but everybody's been working in pajamas. For yeah. Sure. Power casual, though. What a term. OK, let's talk about the business end of this. I mean, how high is the demand for these kinds of clothes? What are those companies seeing? Yeah. So M.M. LaFleur, as an example, um, they said that, you know, before t about 25 percent of their sales were this kind of power casual look. Um, and now they're about 60 percent of their sales. Um, people are just uh, trying to figure out what to wear. And retailers are seeing, you know, demand really high for this type of clothing. Um, but that's just an example. I think people are, are really, you know, not really sure what to put on next. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and just as the pandemic shaped the economy when the world was on lockdown, I mean, what changes are we seeing in retail now that most of the U.S. is opening up? Yeah. So there's definitely this look, you know, back to comfortable clothing. Denim sales are high, which um, a couple of years ago, they weren't as high. Um, people weren't quite as into denim, but over the lockdown period, mom jeans have come back. Um, so looser broad leg jeans are in again. Um, so lots of retailers are seeing that, which, um, you know, is something that 
is definitely new. Um, but also retailers are seeing, you know, a more like a, a an interest in prints and bold colors um, and, you know, very it's kind of I, I think Gen Z is really driving this trend of maximalism. Mm. Um, so mm. that's kind of one of the trends that they're seeing right now. And they're trying to stock up their sel- shelves as fast as they can. Oh, good. I'm all about color and pattern. So that's good news for yeah. me. Leticia Miranda, <laughs> uh, who could be wearing pajama pants right now for all we know. Thank you so much. No, definitely for- <laughs> not wearing pizza socks at all. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. That was a fun one. Up next, the inspiring fitness challenge that is uniting families all across the country. Stay with us. A month-long effort this June is urging people across the country to get active, to raise awareness and promote acceptance for people with disabilities. NBC News senior national correspondent Kate Snow has that story. Joe and Savannah, Gigi's Playhouse started when a Chicago mom who had a child with Down syndrome in 2002 realized that there weren't a lot of positive places for families like theirs to go and get support. This month of June, they launched what they're calling an acceptance challenge, asking all of us to get moving to show support for people with disabilities. Two, three, go! On a sticky summer Saturday, little kids were racing, families walking together. Right tossing here, footballs, right here. Good Good job. dancing from Chicago to Fargo, Fargo. We're moving and grooving. to San Diego, Hola. even as far away as Mexico. Gigi's Playhouse, which runs Down Syndrome Achievement Centers nationwide, kicked off what they call an acceptance challenge for June. Will you accept me? It is time! Nancy Gianni is the energetic founder. Part of why you started Gigi's Playhouse is because of the girl next to you. This yes, girl me. Next, that's right, because of yes, her. Yes, that's the name on it. That's, that's your her name. name on it. Where's my girl? Full disclosure, Nancy's also a friend of my family. My sister-in-law, Kira, works at Gigi's. We profiled the centers on Nightly News back in 2013. They offer free therapy, classes, career skills, and family support. Will you move for acceptance? Will you accept me? But with all the work they've done, Nancy still sees ignorance and a lack of acceptance. For 17 years, we've like given them all the tools. We've worked so hard, free programming, free everything to get them ready for the world. And then I feel like we throw them out there in a world that's not ready for them. The acceptance challenge is a way to unite. There is nothing like being together at a gathering where people are there because they choose to be there. They choose to say, I can't and will accept you as you are. It's like, Kate, there's an energy about that. Gigi, what would you say about the need for acceptance? We have to be generous, be kind, and be accepting, and it would be nice, not me. Can you say hi? Hi! After months of virtual classes during the pandemic, there was joy in just being together. It is so heartwarming just to have everybody back together again. You know that it's okay. He's, he's perfect. Sending a message engraved on every medal the kids took home that day. Be generous, be kind. Their free virtual platform called Gigi's at Home, created during COVID, is still operating. And guys, one of the silver linings, they now reach families in more than 50 countries. Savannah, Joe. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.